And now, ladies and gentlemen, at the console of the museum's mighty world itself, please welcome our very own resident organist, Richard Hills. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and welcome to the feedback of the Musical Museum here. Uh, it's really nice to be back on home turf, playing for you on the distinctive sounding Kingston Wurlitzer. So there really is no other Wurlitzer in the world, arguably, which sounds quite like this, and uh, how wonderful that we get to enjoy it this afternoon. Not just here in person, but to those of you listening on the live stream from home. It makes it terribly exciting, and it was slightly nerve-wracking not knowing who's listening in and from where. I know uh, I've got one friend listening in from the dizzying, glamorous heights of Herne Bay in Kent, uh, but I bet that there are people from around the world. So you're all very welcome as well out there in uh, the big wide world web, and uh, of course you're particularly welcome here today. Hope you're going to enjoy the program, which began with a couple of old favourites, the first of them being Pack Up Your Troubles in Your Old Kit Bag, which was used by Reginald Fort as his signature tune in the days when he used to play this organ at the Regal Kingston. Uh, dear organ aficionados will know that that signature tune did the rounds and went on to become associated very closely with Douglas Reeve, and Reginald Fort himself composed a signature tune called Keep Smiling when he went to the BBC in 1936 because he wanted something original, no doubt, uh, to keep those royalties rolling in, but also to be identified on the radio in the way the signature tunes were originally designed to do. And after that, can't uh, be the bright and breezy 6-8 march, that one from the pen of the great Kenneth Alford called On the Quarter Deck. Now I've got a, a, a host of music for you this afternoon in uh, various different styles that work well on the organ, and I'm going to keep the energy levels going, while I still can anyway, before I get too tired, um, with a wonderful piece of music by Cecil Norman, a little samba which will feature the phantom piano, which in case you're new to the museum, I am able to control from the organ keyboard yeah, like this, uh -huh. and that will take uh, a 
good old bashing in this samba, which is called Tampico. Uh, after that, we're going to go headlong into a selection of tunes from the pen of Ivan Abello. I'm a particular fan of Ivan Abello's music. Together with Noel Coward, he was really one of the greats of the era. And I think Nabello's music works particularly well on the croony sounds of the museum's world itself. Uh, I've played all sorts of pieces of Nabello over the years from many of his different shows, but I thought that I would stick to just one show this afternoon. All of this music comes from a show which opened uh, right at the end of the 1930s on the outbreak of war, in fact, called The Dancing Years. And it included some of Nabello's great hits like the leap year waltz, I can give you the starlight, my dearest dear, the waltz of my heart, primrose, uniform, laurelly. You know, some shows have a, a, an absolute um, multitude of good songs, and this is one of them. So, you're going to hear Tampico by Cecil Norman, and then some music from The Dancing Years by Ivan Abel. Once again, welcome. Thank you for choosing to spend this beautiful afternoon inside, listening to some of the sweetest sounds that you can find on planet Earth. Hope you'll enjoy the program.
months and years composed by Ivan Novello and uh, premiered just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And I'm sure some of those tunes are, are, were recognisable, uh, well, as in known to you, I hope I played them in a way that was recognisable, uh, you, you know what I mean. Um, and some really good melodies which, as I said, suit the, the lush, dark sound of this world so particularly well. Now, uh, a trip to a, a Richard Hills concert wouldn't be complete without hearing a piece or some pieces of music composed by organists of the past. I'm very uh, passionate about doing that. I think it's great to keep their memory alive. And quite a lot of the time, of course, they wrote such jolly good music because they were fine, well-trained musicians who um, were not only in many cases classically trained, but who were working in an industry where if you could write a piece of music and orchestrate it and uh, give it a little bit of a catchy tune, you could guarantee it would be on the air earning you royalties within six weeks. I heard that from one of the uh, light music composers of yesteryear. So a wonderful time for such musicians, and hardly surprising that those compositions then transfer beautifully to the organ. Now, I haven't played this piece for quite some years, uh, and I thought it would be nice to dust it off in preparation for today's program. It's by a gentleman called Stanley Wiley, whom I had the great uh, fortune and honor to meet on a number of occasions. He was for many years the resident organist of the Ritz Cinema in Belfast. He wasn't a Northern Irish native, but he uh, transferred over there while working for ABC theatres and took over from the legendary Joseph Seal, who of course is very associated with this organ from the time it was in the Regal Kingston upon Thames. So uh, Stanley took over from Joe, and Joe Seal, as you can imagine, was a very hard act to follow, but Stanley certainly kept up and got his own following of supporters and was just the most wonderful musician and better still, the most uh, kindly and helpful and lovely gentleman as well. And for young whippersnappers like me, as I was at the time, coming up to these great sort of towering figures of the theatre organ scene, uh, having someone like that patch on the back and say, carry on, you're doing a good job, has really stuck to me to this day. So I think that's uh, a wonderful testament to Stanley the human, as well as Stanley the musician. Now, this piece of music dates from the 1950s, and so much of that sort of mood music, as it was called in the 1950s, follows a similar pattern. Jaunty outer sections, maybe slightly more expansive inner sections. And you'll certainly hear that this is a, a characteristic piece in the sense that the title uh, rather describes the character of the piece. It's called Hurrying Home.
much. Uh, hurrying home to find Stanley White. Well, uh, here's another selection of tunes that I haven't played for a long time, but again, this is music which uh, is the sort of bread and butter, the core repertoire of the theatre organist. And it's all from the pen of um, Rogers and Hart. I think for, for a minute there, because I'm obviously getting to a senior moment in life. Um, Rogers and Hart. And uh, of course, they wrote so many shows together in the era before Richard Rogers went off and wrote music for Oscar Hammerstein II, or with Oscar Hammerstein II. And in celebration of that partnership, Rogers and Hart, um, a film was produced, a biopic, a bio biographical picture in 1948 called Words and Music, because sadly Lorenz Hart died very young and uh, the Hollywood studios felt that it was wonderful to, or, and appropriate to honor their memory and cite the, the songwriting partnership in that way. And uh, it seems like a good aegis to, um, to uh, create a melody under because so many of the shows are represented in that film. So we're gonna hear a little bit of Slaughter on 10th Avenue, we'll hear a small hotel, mountain greenery, uh, Blue Room Manhattan, which of course was a big hit for people like Ella Fitzgerald, well, big hit for just about anyone who sang it, because it's such a good piece of music, and uh, Where or When, one of the loveliest ballads written in the decade. So sit back and enjoy some music from the pen of Rogers and Hart, as featured in the 1948 film, Words and Music.
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, songs from the 1948 film Words and Music, featuring songs written by Rogers and Hart. And um, if I remember them in order, we heard a little snippet of Slaughter on 10th Avenue, that great ballet sequence. There's a small hotel, Mountain Greenery, Blue Room, Manhattan, and Where or When. Beautiful memories. Well, um, do, uh, if you are new to the Musical Museum or have never heard one of these instruments in person before, do come and uh, ask any questions you like in the interval. I shall be floating around, I dare say, and any member of the museum staff who look after the instruments so beautifully will be able to answer your questions. But of course, this is a real pipe organ. There are no electronics at all in here, apart from little electromagnets used to connect the console to the pipes and indeed to the piano. So it really is remarkable that this technology, which is now over 100 years old, uh, as in it was invented 100 years old, this organ is from the early 1930s, but it's still playing on original hardware throughout, so it's a, a wonderful testament to build quality. Uh, obviously it was restored fully when it came into musician, to the museum, but apart from that, it's absolutely original uh, from the day it left the Regal Kingston. And uh, deeply delighted to have members of the uh, City of London Society of Organists here today. We're all most welcome, and uh, look forward to uh, having a chat with you in the interval, and hopefully uh, giving some uh, some idea of how we put together all the sounds. Because uh, at its core, there are um, twelve basic sounds on this organ. In fact, I thought I'd take a little moment just to show you through them. Now, organ for a bit, uh, you might like to hear what goes together to make the sounds we hear. At the base of the organ is a foundation of the diapason, which you will hear in any classic organ. Obviously, it's slightly uh, louder, more exaggerated than you would hear on many classic organs, because these instruments had to fill theatres of two, three, and in some cases, 4,000 seats. So everything is on super high pressure and uh, voice to be very big. Lovely strings, violin and celeste. as you would expect, which goes up to become a piccolo. Some rather unusual sounds now, uh, a saxophone, which is sort of native to the world's organ in disguise. Little colory, uh, very short and buzzy. And then we get into the reed stops, the buzzy things. We have tubers on the organ that sound like this. Particularly fine tuber on this organ. Very rare French trumpet. And English horn, which is really an English horn. So put together, the brass section sounds very imposing. And several of those to the pedal. The back of the theatre organ is the tibia clausa, which is a big stopped flute. But of course we best know it with its tremulant or vibrato, which gives that characteristic sound. So by the time you've added in things like the glockenspiel, Chrysoglot, which is a Chilester. And vibraphone. You've heard the deep chimes earlier. And of course, the kitchen sink department, the marching band stuff, which sounds like this. And of course, visitors to the museum will have seen many of the mechanical instruments downstairs, which have such instruments, would be it uh, glockenspiels or drums and cymbals and things playable from the organ. And just like uh, those, this organ has real percussions, and they're all hit by uh, little pneumatic hammers controlled by wind. So everything you hear is acoustic and real. Well, to close out the first half, we're going to put all of that into action now, and various different combinations of voices, with one of the big um, pieces of the, I suppose, the grand sweep genre. I've just completely invented that. But on the back of things like Richard Abbasell's Warsaw Concerto, there was a bit of a fashion in the 40s and 50s for a uh, sort of mini concerti, almost, of which uh, that is one. The Dream of Olwyn, perhaps you will recall, yeah, fits into that mold. And so does this by Donald Phillips, Skyscraper Fantasy. And I hope you'll be able to 
picture a sort of soaring cityscape as you hear the music. So we're going to finish the first half with Skyscraper Fantasy, your themes from that by Donald Phillips. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. Lots more goodies on the program in the second half, and look forward to having a chat with you in the interval. serving a variety of snacks, ice cream, alcohol, and soft drinks. And for the viewers at home and watching online, there's plenty of time for a cup of tea. So please go and enjoy. We'll be back right after the break. And now, ladies and gentlemen, at the console of the museum's mighty Wurlitzer, please welcome back Richard Hills. <laughs>
and hope you're all suitably refreshed for some more music, which began there with a wonderful passadobe called Amparito Rocca. Very nice to meet some of you in the interval, and there's still a chance to do that after the concert, of course. So do come and say hello and uh, ask away any questions uh, that you might have about this wonderful instrument. Now, just like in the first half, we kept the, uh, the octane level going, shall we see, say, in item number two. I'm going to do exactly the same thing for you in the second half, and hear a lovely piece of music written from, uh, by the, from the pen of Ronald Hammer. Now, Ronald Hammer was a great name in light music. He was a fine arranger. He played a lot um, with orchestras and was also a theatre organist. And he composed this piece, which is rather charmingly entitled Hocus Pocus.
Uh, well, one of the joys about the theatre organ is its versatility. It really can play everything from Bach to the Beatles, to use that hackneyed phrase. And um, there's always uh, things going in waves, don't there? And there was a time when the staple diet of theatre organists would have been music from operetta. So things like the Ivan Abo that we heard earlier, um, all the sort of Rudolf Frimmel works that you might have heard. And the next composer, who the group of whose pieces I would like to play, Sigmund Romberg, was very much in vogue. You'd certainly hear one or two Romberg pieces, I think, if you went to a theatre organ recital uh, back in the 1950s or 60s in the early days of the Cinema Organ Society. And um, I think it's our job, really, on the cinema organ circuit to try and keep some of this music alive, because it really just isn't being heard uh, these days, uh, save a few notable examples. I can think of uh, the John Wilson Orchestra playing pieces of Sigmund Rombo as an example. And uh, I know that John Wilson himself is passionate about operetta, that sort of uh, light, but not as light as a Broadway musical style of music. And it really does have a place in the musical um, sphere. And so we're going to hear now a collection of music by Sigmund Rombo, which comes from a 1926 show, which is arguably one of his very greatest and biggest hits. Music from the Desert
Romberg and the World Operetta from uh, the Desert Song, finishing there with One Alone. Uh, the titles perhaps are a little bit unfamiliar, but I'm sure you will recognize many of those melodies because a good melody never dies, does it? Well, uh, time just for a couple of things before I leave you for this afternoon, and we're going to hear another piece written by a British theatre organist. This chap in question, uh, name was Vic Hammett, happy laughing boy Vic Hammett, as he used to be known by Robin Richmond, who used to give these monikers to uh, people to be introduced on his radio program, The Organist Entertains, which uh, had a glorious run on Radio 2, as I'm sure many of you will remember. Now, uh, Vic Hammett, uh, goodness knows what inspired him to write this. There are uh, bits of folklore around about long, tedious journeys down country lanes. But anyway, I hope you'll enjoy it. He called the piece Horse Box, and you'll see why. It sort of fits into the flippity coppity trot trot sort of genre. I'm using all the technical terms for you this afternoon, you can tell. Um, and uh, you'll hear in the middle a wonderful chorus played on the xylophone, which is unenclosed over on that side of the organ. I've got a recording of this. Uh, played by Vic Hammett, actually, on the organ that was installed many years ago at Buckingham Town Hall, now the Worthing Wurlitzer. And uh, he, at this point, uses the xylophone, which I think must have a microphone underneath every note. It sounds like an on shamard xylophone the uh, recording industry. Anyway, we'll get something of that effect here, but hopefully um, not quite in that lead. Anyway, Vic Hammett's Horse Box. Suites. 
but um, we're going to stick in March territory for the closing item today. And there's quite a lot of good Mar marches to choose from. You know, be it uh, uh, the Knightsbridge March, which is a theme tune in town tonight, or Dam Busters March, or Calling All Workers. Uh, you seem to have a great list of marches. But here is one which I think, uh, in spite of not being one of his best known, is uh, one of his best. It's from a suite of music called the Three Elizabeths Suite, and I thought this would be appropriate to play today because of the Queen's, Her Majesty the Queen's um, Jubilee, which we've just celebrated. And uh, someone at some point suggested to Eric Coates that it might be a nice idea to write a suite of music based on the Three Elizabeths who have had their place in the British monarchy over the years. And uh, given that at the time, suites of music in three or more movements were very popular, um, and uh, orchestral suites were often, of course, arranged for the piano as well, in, and for different uh, groups of ensembles. It was a, a format that was very uh, well liked. And so Eric Potts thought this would be a great idea. Uh, the first movement is called Halcyon Days, and it remembers uh, Queen Elizabeth I. The second is called Springtime in Glans, and is reminiscent of uh, the Highlands of Scotland, and uh, is, of course, meant to portray Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And the final movement, when composed, was called The Youth of Britain, The Princess Elizabeth. And only a few short years later, that title had to change from Princess, um, uh, from uh, Spirit of Youth, Princess Elizabeth, to, um, of course, reflect the fact that Her Majesty had been crowned in 1953. So I thought it would be uh, great to finish with Youth of Britain by Eric Coates in honor of the Platinum Jubilee. It's a jolly good march, and uh, I hope it and all the other things on the program have been to your liking. Please do come and support and hear the museum the world itself once again uh, in the future. If you can, your support is greatly appreciated, and I'll look forward to playing for you next time. Thanks for coming. Safe journey home. Bye from me.
You've been watching the Musical Museum Hub, a digital broadcast from the Musical Museum in London. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you want to see more of our content. To find out more about the Musical Museum, visit musicalmuseum.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.